by nature, Tolkien does get darker and darker the deeper you go into his world. And so the third film, it, uh, it is going into a, a dark place, but he's, he's heading towards, you know, some kind of redemption in, in his story. But, uh, but he's not afraid to, to uh, put some, you know, quite tragic moments in there, which if you've read the book, you'll know what they are. Definitely. And with Thorin in particular, I mean, he was already going a fairly dark direction in the second film. Yeah, and he, um, you know, that's one thing I enjoyed about, you know, the division of the movies into three is that we were able to, you know, eke out that, that insanity just a little bit further. So we, we could plot some moments in movie two where you just start to get a glimmer of his, his state of mind and his irrationality that's kicking in and the, the fear of the dragon sickness and the gold loss, which starts the minute he gets to the door, really. So uh, it, was, it was fun to, to be able to play that slowly and let it drip feed into the third film. What's really interesting is you, through the second film, you see a sort of plateau of that relationship. Like the trust was found at the end of the first film, and you know it starts to become galvanised because Bilbo really proves himself. He finds the door to the to the mountain, and he enters first, and and he's almost sacrificed by Thorin uh, when he realises that the dragon is awake. So it's it it's hits quite a brutal, sort of unforgiving moment. Uh, but then when when Thorin gets in there and he sees Bilbo has survived, I think there's a there's a sense of uh, who is this little this little man that can that can face off a dragon. And into the third film, that relationship gets quite singular. Well, I mean, I don't think he would have had a choice. I think it would have possessed him. He would have probably shut himself away inside the mountain and become. Sauron, but like a mini Sauron. <laughs> Very small. Like a but... small Sauron. But then he may have grown. He, yeah, he may have used the power of the One Ring to grow. To become... Taller. Uh, interesting. Now, do you think he would have just stopped at normal human size? Or... No, I think he would have just made himself massive. He'd have probably been as big as that golden statue at the end of the second film. Uh, there's, there's a, a much longer version of Merc Wood that we shot. Um, there's a really beautiful sequence where Bomber falls into the, into the stream, the enchanted stream, and we have to carry him. And then also Thorin and Bilbo see the white stag, which is the sort of manifestation of the elf king, kind of projecting himself into the, into the forest. And Thorin kind of symbolically tries to kill the stag with his crossbow, which I, you know, I was really disappointed that that couldn't be in the film because I do think, I think it's like a, a little beacon of, of the relationship between Thorin and the Elf King. The, there's a huge challenging scene at the end of the third film which we can't probably talk about, but um, the barrel sequence I think was, was challenging because it was piecing it together over many different weeks in different locations and trying to find continuity. Um, and obviously fighting imaginary orcs whilst sort of strapped into a barrel was, was pretty challenging. It's got to be the Battle of the Five Armies. I think, you know, we know that it's going to be big, but I have no idea how big that's going to be until we start seeing the final cut of the film. And, uh, but I do know that Peter is very, very interested in first, first and Second World War military history, so I think he's going to create something pretty spectacular.